This was it. What do you think I've been working the past 10 years of my life for? I was going to be the youngest world champ in the history of the game. That's over now. They took it. That was today. Today. Deleted scenes from the MCU's Iron Man and Incredible Hulk would have made Tobey Maguire the Spider-Man of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this would have changed the future of the MCU, Daredevil, and Sony's Venomverse forever. Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and for the past 20 years, the Spider-Man character has been on quite the ride. We've had reboots, reboots of reboots, spinoffs, animated movies, you name it. But it all started way back in 2002 with Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. My name's the Human Spider. Tobey did three Spider-Man films, and each holds a very special place in all of our hearts. Yeah, except Spider-Man 3. Nobody, even Spider-Man 3. In fact, we have a great video up on the channel right now talking about why Spider-Man 3 is actually hated but great. And a little later, I'll be telling you how Spider-Man 3 could have been the key to kicking off the MCU with Spider-Man from the jump. I mean, just a year after Spider-Man 3's release in 2007, we got the start of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Iron Man. I am Iron Man. In an early draft of Iron Man, we would have learned that Tony Stark played a pivotal role in the creation of Dr. Otto Octavius's mechanical arms featured in Raimi's Spider-Man 2. And Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker was wanted for a cameo in The Incredible Hulk. But both ideas were nixed by Sony, making it to where we'd have to wait almost a decade to see Spider-Man in the MCU with Tom Holland. But imagine a world where Tobey Maguire never hung up the red spandex. What what if Raimi's trilogy had been the first three films of the MCU? I'm listening. You know what, man? It is crazy to think about exactly how different the MCU would be if it was planned out from the beginning. What are you doing? Skincare, bro. Is that a thing that, that humans do? <laughs> it's a thing that humans should do, especially men and especially in cold weather. Like all my life, I thought skincare was only for women, but then I worked outside for a lot of years and I noticed my skin was starting to crack, I got sunburned easier, and I was starting to age like really fast. So my doctor said I should start using some kind of skincare, but like it's incredibly daunting. But geology makes skincare easy to understand, and that's why we partnered with them for this video. Now, the first step to using skincare is always the hardest, but then geology makes it so easy to get started and take care of yourself. And Guess what? It actually works. A good daily skincare routine can help you fight acne, prevent wrinkles, combat darker puffy eyes, and just overall, it makes your skin feel great. Once I started this skincare routine, I rarely break out anymore and my skin is no longer oily. Yeah, plus you just look fantastic. Ah, you. But like I said, what I appreciate the most is how easy they make this. You take a quick quiz on Geology's website and then their team of dermatologists customize this routine for you. Plus there are these cards which explain each step, show you how much to use and what it does. Earlier I did step one, everyday face wash, and now I'm gonna do step two, eye cream for dark circles. Next is night cream for bedtime. So Geology has more than 7,000 five-star reviews and they've won 30 awards with ingredients that deliver real results. And right now, for a limited time, they are offering a great deal. If you use our code, Geology will give you 70% off your first skincare trial set. And on top of that, you get an additional bonus offer of up to 50% off one of the skin, hair, and body add-on products when you add it to your trial. I highly recommend the deodorant and body wash. They smell amazing. So guys, click our link below to get your deal in Geology. After saving the city from a giant sand monster and an alien from outer space, Peter Parker would have entered a much bigger universe. He would have proved that Spider-Man could be much more than a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Now this would inspire Nick Fury of S.H.I.E.L.D. to finally bring Spidey into the fold. There was an idea. Imagine if Spider-Man 3 had given us a post credit scene of Peter arriving back at his apartment and sitting in the shadows of Sam Jackson's Nick Fury. Fury reveals that he's been keeping an eye on Peter these past few years, and that Spider-Man has done the city of New York a great service, and that a little agency called S.H.I.E.L.D. would like his help on an even bigger mission. And then we learn that that Venom symbiont wasn't the only one that crash landed on Earth, and there are more. You're a very difficult person to contact, Spider-Man. In the original version of the post credit scene for Iron Man, we hear Nick Fury mentioned mutants and even a reference to the webhead. As if gamma accidents, radioactive bug bites, and assorted mutants weren't enough. Plus, there's nothing in the Raimi films that contradicts the first phase of the MCU. Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Incredible Hulk, Thor, and Captain America all could have panned out exactly the same way and existed alongside Raimi's films. And Spider-Man could have seamlessly fit into the Avengers and been a member of that OG team that assembled in 2012 for the Battle of New York. I mean, Toby's Peter Parker would have fit in so well with the original six Avengers. He was close in age with them all, and they all could have had some great interactions. He'd have this deep respect for Captain America and always called Steve Sir, even though Steve said it wasn't really necessary. He'd have a nerdy science bro relationship with Bruce Banner. And oh my God, he would have hated Tony Stark. Right, but Tony Stark and Spider-Man are like best buds. Yeah, sure, but Tom Holland's Peter Parker is a lot younger than Tony, and Peter looked up to him as a mentor. But Toby's Peter Parker would have been a lot closer in age to Tony, and they would have had very different upbringings. What do you know about high society? Oh, 
Uh, well, I... Yeah, don't answer that. Tony Stark was the son of a billionaire and inherited his father's wealth and company, while Peter Parker was a working class guy who worked hard for what he had and he didn't have much. And Toby's version of Peter was very reserved and respectful, unlike the very full of himself Tony Stark. But then again, when Parker would put the mask on, he would rival even Tony Stark in the quips department. I... Hey kiddo, <clears throat> let mom and dad talk for a minute, will ya? You have no idea what you're dealing with. Uh... Shakespeare in the Park. So, don't get me wrong, I love Tom Holland's Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield's too, and I'm glad that we got their Spider-Man. But part of me wonders how much better the already phenomenal Infinity Saga would have been had the OG Spider-Man been there from the jump, and if the Spider-Man character overall would have been in a better place if it still had Tobey Maguire playing him for all these years. Characters like Venom, Carnage, Kraven, Miles Morales, and even Madam Web could have been major players in the Infinity and Multiverse Sagas. So, I want to go through the entirety of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and talk about how how Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would have fit perfectly into the MCU, even better than Tom Holland's, and how things would have looked had a more mature and experienced Spider-Man been around from the beginning. You're the Spider-ling, crime-fighting spider. You're Spider-Boy? Spider-Man. So, the Raimi Spider-Man films already had several things about them that would have worked great in the MCU. The first movie showed us the military trying to purchase mechanized armor suits, as well as a human enhancement serum to create essentially super soldiers. So, let's start with the super soldier serum. We know that the MCU's Hulk was created during Bruce Banner's attempt to replicate the serum that created Captain America. So, they could have easily incorporated Oscorp into the MCU and revealed that Norman was trying to replicate the serum as well. And just how Banner's failed attempt created the Hulk, Osborne's created the Green Goblin. Back to formula. The first Spider-Man film also revealed that way back in 2002, Norman Osborn was researching nanotech. I read all your research on nanotechnology, really brilliant. Nanotech, of course, became a major player in the MCU's later films, especially with Spider-Man's Infinity War suit. It would have been great to see Willem Dafoe's Norman Osborn be an old colleague of Howard Stark. And hey, in the fake death MCU, maybe they could have even brought Norman back in the later films. In Spider-Man 2, we heard mention of Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's have some fun. It's 2012 and Loki has come to conquer Earth on behalf of Thanos. Alongside him are alien symbiotes who have infiltrated every level of government on Earth. They crash landed on Earth back in 2007, just like the Black Symbiote in Spider-Man 3. These symbionts have taken over various government officials, including S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. A symbiote has even bonded with Peter Parker's high school bully turned war vet, Flash Thompson. Now, I know the Black Symbiote in Spider-Man 3 is supposed to be Venom, but they never actually call it Venom in the movie. So, we're just gonna pretend it was a random Black symbiote and not Venom. And Joe Manganiello's Flash Thompson will take the place of Eddie Brock by donning another Black symbiote suit that will be the real Venom of the MCU and take on the moniker of Agent Venom like in the comics. Okay, so all these symbiotes have been infiltrating the world's governments and have been awaiting orders from their boss, the Mad Titan himself, Thanos. And instead of the Chitauri being the alien army that attacks New York, it's actually an invasion from within. All these symbionts who have been living and hiding within humans morph into the big bulking alien creatures and attack New York City. And early on in the film, when Loki arrives, Clint Barton's Hawkeye won't be brainwashed. Oh good, I said that's kind of stupid. Yep, instead it's Agent Flash Thompson who will betray Fury and Hawkeye and join Loki. We saw Loki manipulate a lot of people's minds in that first Avengers movie, turning good guys into villains for most of the film. But with the symbiote army, it can be the symbionts making good people break bad and assist Loki and Thanos in their invasion. We'll also get some backstory on how the symbiote's home planet was destroyed and how they made a deal with Thanos to help him conquer Earth. Thanos wants the Infinity Stones and the symbiotes want a new home, so they assemble to take Earth. The movie would pan out pretty much the same as before. The Avengers would assemble, defeat Loki and the symbionts, and send a message to Thanos that Earth is not to be trifled with. But a subplot would be added to the film where Peter tries to save Flash from his bond with the symbiote. And by using Loki's staff, Peter is able to break through the symbiote's mind control and tap into the mind of Flash Thompson. It's also revealed that Thanos is the one who had the symbiote's home planet destroyed in secret so that they would join his army out of desperation. Upon this reveal, Venom would no longer answer to Thanos and he and Flash would take on a more symbiotic relationship, setting up a future for the Venom character to become an anti-hero in the MCU, and maybe even escape into space and join the Guardians of the Galaxy like in the comics. And Venom would also have a motive to seek revenge on Thanos, just like the other Guardians. And speaking of the Guardians, let's move into Phase 2. Phase 2 would feature Raimi's Spider-Man 4. Now, Spider-Man 4 would feature Vulture as the villain, just like Raimi originally intended. And this Vulture would have a very similar story to the Vulture in Spider-Man Homecoming. Adrian Toomes will have invested a 
a lot of time and money into his crew helping to clean up after the Battle of New York, but then he's undercut by Stark and the Department of Damage Control. I apologize, Mr. Toombs, but all salvage operations are now under our jurisdiction. Toombs, being a fellow member of the working class, just like Peter Parker, would make for a very interesting dynamic. We could see Tony Stark cameo in a scene where Peter confronts him about screwing over workers on the cleanup jobs, further laying the groundwork for the coming rift between Tony and Peter for Captain America Civil War. Come Age of Ultron, Spider-Man will be on the side of Cap and his objection to playing with AI. Now, Peter has had direct experience with the dangers of artificial intelligence in his battle with Otto Octavius. These things have turned you into something you're not. Don't listen to them. And Peter will be able to point out that Tony has botched mechanized AI before with the creation of Doc Ock's mechanized arms, a callback to Iron Man 1 and Spider-Man 2's removed connection. The question then becomes, which side will Peter take in the debate over the Sokovia Accords? Now, in the comics, Peter Parker sides with Tony Stark and reveals his identity to the world, something we almost saw at the end of Spider-Man Homecoming. It's about 50 reporters behind that door, and I'll introduce the world, the newest official member of the Avengers, Spider-Man. In the MCU, we saw Peter Parker on Iron Man's side as well, but we have to remember that Peter was only 14 years old in that movie. I can't go to Germany. Why? I got homework and he was likely going to be on Tony Stark's side either way. But if we look at Peter in Homecoming, Far From Home and No Way Home, he doesn't really seem to abide by any set of rules implemented by the Accords. He still does his vigilante thing and seeks to keep his identity a secret, and I'm not even sure Peter ever actually signed the Accords. In fact, I don't think he could have without his legal guardian being present. What the f The point is that I'm not so sure that the MCU's Peter Parker would have really been on Tony's side had he been a little bit older when it all went down, and I don't think that Tobey Spider-Man would be either. He could have revealed his identity to the world any time in those three standalone movies, but he never did, showing us that maintaining his secret identity was important to him, something that I'm not sure he could do with the Sokovia Accords. Talking about superheroes who have enemies who will try to harm them and the people close to them. This isn't about privacy for privacy's sake. If this information is not protected, it could put a lot of people in a lot of danger. I also don't think that Spider-Man would be interested in having to ask permission from a governing body before he can swing in and save someone from harm. If Toby Spider-Man were the Spider-Man of the MCU, I think we'd see Spider-Man on Cap's side come Civil War, or on no side at all. And in Phase 3, following the events of Civil War, we could get a Spider-Man 5 that shows Spider-Man's vigilantism under much harsher scrutiny than we've ever seen before. While characters like Cap, Widow, Sam Wilson, Wanda, the others are on the run from the law, Spider-Man remains in New York fighting crime vigilante style like he always has. Only this time, the police are under strict orders to bring him in. Freeze! He's you and the tights anyway. don't move! Spider-Man 5 would open with John Jameson, the son of J. Jonah Jameson. Big party for an American hero. My son, the astronaut. John is also the ex-fiance of Mary Jane. Beautiful Miss Mary Jane Watson just agreed to marry me. John's rocket is about to launch on a mission to Mars. J. Jonah Jameson is there as a proud father, and Peter Parker is there as a Daily Bugle photographer. The rocket malfunctions, and they're told to evacuate because the rocket is about to blow. Peter quickly runs into an alley, stripping his day clothes, and dons his mask. Peter Parker swings in to save the astronauts. He's able to lift one astronaut from their seat, but John's leg is stuck, and Peter is having trouble getting him loose. John yells for Spider-Man to save the other astronauts and to get out of there. Spider-Man argues, but John says if he stays any longer, they're all going to die. Spider-Man then grabs the other astronaut and swings away just as the rocket explodes. We see Jameson let out a scream as tears roll down his face, showing us a side of him that we've never actually seen before. Jameson never liked Spider-Man, but now he's out for blood because he blames him for the death of his son. And Jameson claims that Spider-Man purposely didn't save John to get back at Jameson for his critical articles about Spider-Man over the years. Spider-Man won't let me take any more pictures. You've turned the whole city against him. A fact I'm very proud of. The other astronauts speak in Spider-Man's defense and tell the truth about what happened, but Jameson just isn't convinced. Jameson then hires Matt Gargan to become the Scorpion, just like he does in the comics. Jameson has Scorpion fake attack the Daily Bugle to lure Spider-Man to come save the day. Jameson's plan is to have Scorpion kill Spider-Man, but during their battle, Scorpion's suit that was provided to him by Jameson malfunctions and it kills him. Jameson lies and claims that he witnessed Spider-Man murder the Scorpion in cold blood, and just like in Far From Home and No Way Home with Mysterio, Spider-Man will be framed for murder. Well, I'll tell you what I call him. Public enemy number one. Charlie Cox's Daredevil will then seek out Spider-Man to bring him to justice, but in their encounter, Daredevil will be able to tell that Spider-Man is telling the truth that he didn't kill the Scorpion. I didn't kill him. I believe you, Miss Page. Daredevil then recommends that Spider-Man meet with a lawyer friend of his, Matt Murdock, and we'll see Spider-Man, not Peter Parker, but Spider-Man, costume and all, go to trial. This movie would serve as a character study on what it means to be a vigilante, and we'll see a different side of Peter Parker, a Peter Parker who has to save Spider-Man and help prove his alter ego's innocence. And in this movie, we'll finally see Peter Parker reveal to Jameson that he is Spider-Man. I'm Spider-Man. <laughs> 
You serious? Now, upon that reveal, we'll get a great exchange between the two characters about rage and revenge, and Jameson will ultimately agree to come clean. Because, even though he hates Spider-Man, and even though he's been hard on Peter Parker for years, he knows that he's not a murderer. And this will be a callback to this scene from the very first Spider-Man, when Jameson saved Peter from the Green Goblin. I don't know who he is, his stuff comes in the mail! You're lying! I swear! And we could also learn through Daredevil that the rocket that blew up was funded by Wilson Fisk, aka the Kingpin, and that the Kingpin had rigged it to blow up on purpose so that Spider-Man Spider-Man would attempt to save the day and hopefully die in the process. Yeah, that was random. Well, I just really like the idea of Daredevil and Spider-Man stories being linked together and the two being tight like they are in the comics. And Kingpin would have been a great villain to see in one of Raimi's Spider-Man films. Anyways, when Spider-Man ultimately wins his case and his name is cleared, we'll see him step out on the courthouse steps to take questions. And when he looks into the sky, we see the Black Order ship from Infinity War entering the atmosphere and the screen cuts to black. Infinity War happens pretty much the same. Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Spider-Man team up in New York. They go to Titan, fight Thanos, Spider-Man gets dusted, and the world Prize. Following the death of Spider-Man, we see a young man named Miles Morales step up and become the new Spider-Man during the five years of the blip. And plot twist, it's this kid from Spider-Man 2. Eat your green vegetables. That's what my mom is always saying. I just never actually believed her. In between Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, we get a Miles Morales Spider-Man movie. And then Miles will join the Avengers in Endgame in their attempt to bring back those who were blipped. We'll see Peter Parker make his triumphant return in the third act. And come the end of the film, following the sacrifice of Tony Stark and the retirement of Steve Rogers, Peter Parker will also decide to hang up his suit. After being gone for five years, he'll realize that he missed a lot of time with MJ and that he wants to have a life and a family. And now that Miles is around, Peter will feel comfortable to retire as Spider-Man and pass the torch officially to Miles. So that's our pitch for what the MCU would have looked like had Tobey Maguire Spider-Man been there the whole time. Big shout out to the writer of this video, Mr. Colton Ogburn, the guy who's trapped eternally in our television but doesn't know it, so please don't tell him. You can find links to his socials below. What do you think, guys? Should Tobey have been the original Spider-Man? Let us know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.